I have an approach, um, and, and, and in one case uh, I said yes, because I, personally, even in my situation, I was like, yeah. It was a spawn of market where I'm like, I didn't have interest in really pursuing it because it wasn't worth my time and effort. Um, so I was like, all right, that's free money. And I'm like, you know, sure, why not? I mean, they weren't necessarily even going to pay me anything for it. That I would just get, you know, a, a you know, revenue split of, of, of something. Um, now, anytime I've ever pursued, I've never had any luck, personally. Okay, yeah, so it seems like to be successful in your market, they will come. Uh, one thing I said. Was everyone in my session the other day where I said that? <laughs> Build it and they will come. Exactly. Um, I can add, though, if there are publishers interested in particular sets of rights, that could be an opportunity for you to follow up with the publishers that you previously queried and say, I'm still interested in working with you. Maybe it's a publisher you wanted to work with all along, and maybe the extra interest in your series now could, you know, Get so you a second oh, offer. Just so you know, I just signed Polish rights. I just signed Korean rights for this. Yeah, or or, the entire rights have, are still available. or someone has approached me and asked about the Polish rights, but I've always wanted to work with you. Wondered if you're interested too. You know, it doesn't hurt to oh, see okay. if you get more. Something <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Yep. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Pat. I'm a professional translator, ATA certified from Spanish into English. Um, I'm about to release my first two books uh, of my own work. And um, so my main character is this bilingual guy, a white guy, just like me, except he's got a full head of hair, right? <laughs> a little stronger. Um, so my, and it's set in San Diego, and they go down into Mexico, and there's, there's Spanish in it and stuff, so I'm definitely going to get it translated, you know? Um, my plan is to put it in, in Mexico and Spain and Central and South America and stuff. Would you mind talking a little bit about what I need to know as I get into that? I think for this specific market um, you have to decide which flavor of Spanish you are writing or let it translate, for example, the Spanish Spanish and the um, Central American Spanish. And what we have seen with, with Spanish um, with Spanish books, um, it was really hard to get into the market, at least with what we knew, knew from the English and from the German market. And therefore, it might be better to have a um, publisher there that has experience, because um, you can't replicate everything that's possible with Amazon.com. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that last part that I can't replicate everything on Amazon. Yeah, for Amazon. example, um, um, when, when you have a publisher that's experienced um, to market everything on, on Amazon, it may be hard to, um, to get into, uh, for example, the Latin American market because they might not be buying on Amazon.com. Um, so um, you have to look out for um, other possibilities um, to publish that. I think um, don't assume that just because it exists in the US uh, Amazon that it exists in foreign markets like one of the things that com comes up constantly is um, not every region has ACX so just because you get a translation doesn't mean you'll be able to use ACX to audio publish in a different country I think specifically this, the very, there's a variety of Spanish marketplaces and they all act and respond in different ways than even what we're seeing in the German marketplace. Um, so, you, you know, I think every single region, every single language, you have to really know what's working in that region. And if it's not something that you can do yourself like you would do on Amazon.com, you, you need to find someone that can help you do the thing that's going to work for that region. Yeah, and, and I did an analysis in Spanish. I mean, I'm published in Spanish, and that, that was the one case where I, I chose to go through a local publisher in uh, Seville. So, um, and, um, you know, and, and realistically, it was what a lot of panelists said, is that there are a variety of Span uh, Spanish that gets spoken, the translation would be, you know, slightly different, you know, different keywords, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and the Amazon presence is much 
Um, like for instance, I mean, my, my books were, you know, through through the publisher, not yeah, not through my own publisher because I wouldn't have had the time and energy or know how necessarily to get it in train stations, airports. And, you know, I mean, it was just all over the place, you know, and which is great to see. You know, I'm not there, but you know, I'm of it. Um, but you know, as an indie, it's hard to do that. Thank you. So let's say hypothetically you had enough money for to commission one language translation of your book. How would you go about choosing which language you would you would you get you get one bullet in your gun? How how do you go about choosing what might you think about? This is self-published, this wouldn't be through some other press. So you're you're self-publishing it somewhere. How would you go about thinking about that? What what genre? Just a sci fi. I would say German. Uh, and, and largely because uh, outside of the Chinese market, which is almost impossible to ever get into, you can think at ISBNs as a U.S. citizen, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of complications there. Um, so, uh, but without a doubt, um, it, it's the top market for that, you know, uh, several genres, but you know, sci fi being one of them. Yeah, it's, it, you would maybe assume that the biggest market would be the one that has the most native speakers in it. So. Uh, it's not really the case. It turns out that Germany, even though there's only like, I don't know, maybe a hundred million, like, I'm thinking about throwing the Austrians, some of the Swiss, a couple people in Namibia. But so it's not a huge global population, but they are interested in reading. There is, it's still very dominated by the traditional publishing industry. So, you know, you have to make a good investment in things like a really professional translation, amazing editing, really great cover art, because you have, you're gonna have to stand up against the traditionally published things there. There's fewer indies in the market, um, and the, you know, the readers are very particular, they are used to high quality, it extends to the audio narration, um, so it's not, it's not something you wanna take lightly, but I do think that that's, you know, if you put, if you wanna put all your money on one country, Germany, and let, let me add one thing, and, and I'm actually going to ask a question on behalf of the audience because it, it just came to mind, you know, and it's related to your question. Like, for instance, when, when you're going to go ahead and invest, you know, I'm a big believer in, you know, quality, you know, yields results better than, you know, good quality versus, you know, mediocre quality. So the question would be, how do you find a good translator? And, uh, you know, everyone probably has different approaches that you Say, but you know, I cheated heavily when I did this, and I, you know, maybe a very um, not, not not normal way of going about it. But I went ahead and looked at you know, in the genre that I was going to first publish in, but like, let's say in Germany, I was looking on Amazon. All right, who are the best sellers that I that I you know that match, match my genre? Who are the translators for that? You know, and typically tra trad pub you know books. And I go, okay. Those are the, because they list the translator, they list the author, and they list the translator. And I go, can I hunt down these translators and find them? And if I can, let me see if I can strike up an email and see if they'll freelance. And if they do, well, if nothing else, it's a vetted you know, resource. And I'm like, can I afford it, can I not afford it? That's always gonna be a, a debate. But it's an easy way to find resources that you already know someone else has vetted. Otherwise, you end up having, you know, especially if you're not a native speaker of the language you're translating to, you're dependent on the mercy of the translator. Check out the reviews. Check out the reviews on Amazon. Just, it's good enough to Google Translate that. You'll see if the native speakers did not respond well to grammar choices or thought that you know the themes didn't work. So yeah. Yeah, we're looking, looking to get into our first translation over this coming year. Um, and I guess my question is kind of like, for somebody new stepping in, what are the things I need to look out for that you would recommend to somebody new to look out for? So it's a process, team you need to build, cost, like what, just in the high level, my to be detailed, like kind of high level, to somebody a newbie, how do you, how do you go about this? I would say first you have to decide what you want to do. For example, you can do everything yourself. You can search your um, translators, editors, 
like he's doing. Of course, then you have to upfront the money yourself. If you can spend it, fine. For example, in RPG, there is Tao Wong, and he is refinancing everything himself. Of course, he gets 100% of the income. If you don't want, don't want to care about that, maybe find a publisher that is um, working in the genres you are working on. Of course, then you get a lower percentage, but you don't have to care for it. You don't have um, the financial risk. Yeah, just to be clear, I would be talking about I would do what you do. I would want to do all of that. So the first thing that you'll want to look at uh, is how you want to go about that translation. Are you going to use something like DeepL, have editors come in behind you? Are you going to use translators? Um, finding translators, you know, you, you just speaking a little bit to that. Um, our experience is that it's the same thing. Find someone that's already utilizing someone um, and make sure that that partnership is going to work. You can look, you know, on Readsy, you can get on Upwork, you can, you know, get on all of these sites to look for people, but then you, you're really going to have to come up with a vetting process of your own. Um, in that case, I would do what we do with our copy editors in terms of I would send them a, a, a sample piece to have them translate and then find someone who you know that's a native speaker and say, hey, would, would you take a look at this and make sure that they did a good job um, so that you know that you can trust them moving forward. It's probably going to be a long, ugly process, just like everything within Need, right? Like the first person you use might not be the person that takes you to the finish line. Um, so it's just kind of like creating that pipeline and, and looking, looking at that whole pipeline and understanding, okay, I need a translator. It's going to go through that. Then, then I'm going to need, you know, I don't know, maybe you'll need a copy editor after that. Depends on how good the translator is. You're definitely going to need proofers. You're going to need a reader team. So we, we started, before we moved into German, we started asking our readers early on, like, hey, who here is, is you know, reading in the German marketplace? Who's a native German speaker? Who would be willing to be on our street team um, and get an advanced copy of this book to kind of help us make sure that we have, you know, that we're, that the translation is good and all that stuff. So start building out that core team of people before you even kind of enter the, the marketplace. I would say it's also, important to make sure that the juice is worth the squeeze because you have to sit back and appreciate the fact that you're already in the largest market for indie authored ebooks, audiobooks. Um, so we can all be happy about that as mostly <coughs> the English speakers in this room. But um, and then I think you know there's obviously also indie authors in different regions and it's a big priority for them to get into the English market because they know it's the most lucrative and the most open and you know competitive but a lot of opportunity for them. I think that, that it's really tempting and there's other publishers here who will tell you you need to be in every format, you need to be in every language, but it it could be a really huge investment and it's a, it can be a big time suck. So maybe your time is better spent building your profile for a while before jumping into anything like this. Um, and again, like just to reiterate, we've always wanted to really trust the experts. Um, to Jeanette's point, like you're not in a strong position to know if it's a good translation if you don't have a, a strong level of comfort in a foreign language. Um, so for, for Podium's perspective, um, for instance, we've our first Spanish language audiobook was actually uh, an indie author who we've done the English translations for. And then he wanted us to do the Spanish language audiobooks too. So we did the, the native Spanish audiobooks for him um, through Audible and Storytel. Um, we've also done a number of licensing deals with Saga Egmont. They're a really major um, traditional publisher based out of Denmark, and they're doing foreign language translations for a number of our top IP, including like Craig Allenson's Expeditionary Force and K.A. Knight's uh, Den of Vipers. But they're doing them all formats and simultaneously in um, Italian, French, Polish, German, and Spanish. So that's gonna take a really long time. That's lining up a lot of different translators, editors, um, great cover art, don't forget about little details like your work descriptions and every, your author name, all those things have to be optimized for their local markets. So we're partnering with Saga because they can be the experts in all of those regions and all those languages for us. 
Um, and you know, that's where we think our authors are gonna get the best value, is working with a top publisher for those specific regions. And for the question, um, how to avoid the quality of your translators that you are finding, when you are publishing in English, it's most likely that you have some German readers, because um, for some English um, authors, I think you can um, say that's true, um, you have German uh, readers just because they, they are already into your book, and I think they give you an honest um, um, opinion, if the quality is good or not, or if you have to change something. Oh yeah, yeah. In, 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 in fact, some, every once in a while, I publish a book in German before I publish the English version, and I always get emails from my German readers going, I, where's the English book? I, I like to read the native version before I read the, the translated version, so I know what it's really supposed to say. So, I, 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 I will make one, one point though, and, and this is really just how to think about translation. Um, because there are a lot of people who will hang their, shield, uh, their shingle up as a translator, and they're not wrong. They're probably a native, you know, you know, speaker of the language, whatever the language is. But realize that a lot of people who advertise themselves as translators oftentimes are not necessarily literary translators, but they're they're the translators of websites or restaurant menus or whatever, which doesn't really require a lyrical sense of sensibility in how you write. Think about it yourself. If you're requested to go write up a restaurant menu, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's easy. Um, if, you, if, you, if someone asks you to write a book, that's a very different thing to do. Um, even if you're given kind of like, here's what the story's about, go, go writing a book with a bigger challenge than just writing this regular book. Hi, so I have self-published translations in German. My translator helps me with making social media posts and I've established a German newsletter with automations, all of that, but I'm wondering what are some effective ways to actually advertise German translations, especially when you don't speak the language? I would say AMS because it's not possible on, on the German Amazon store and Facebook and to some extent on the Instagram because they are tied together. Agreed. Thank you. And, and also, can I get your translator's info? <laughs> 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 they make a lot of good stuff. Yes, You're lucky. It's amazing. Yeah. You're lucky. Um, but with AMS ads, beyond this? auto, beyond category ads. Can you use the microphone? You gotta tilt it down towards yeah. you and get closer. Sorry, I'm short. <laughs> um, do beyond auto ads, category ads, do you do keyword ads? What bidding strategies would you use? Uh, we are searching for other authors that are really working in the German market, so we are looking at the, the top lists. Um, but I must admit that the advertising is doing some other guy. So I'm just just getting getting um, the overall details. So. I literally gave a session on this yesterday, um, uh, having to do with AMS, uh, you know, advertising, and I used my German stuff as an example. So, uh, so, so, if you go to Eventy, you can actually download that presentation, and I, I wrote longhand a lot of that data. So, to answer a lot of your, the questions you just asked, you know, I, I would say go, go, you know, Emmy Rothman, you know, yesterday it was Palace Three, it was a large one um, uh, that. You know, that download my presentation and it'll have all the information. Because it, it, the answer is complicated. <laughs> you know, so it, it's hard, hard to give you an exact direction for the presentation. Excellent, thank you. Hello, um, I'm curious of your opinion on the ebook versus paperback marketplace, specifically for Germany, but if you go in other markets, it's great too. Um, for instance, I've had an offer for just my ebook rights in Germany, they're not interested in paperback because they want to put it in KU. Um, and so I'm like, well, that's nice, but if I split the rights, then who's going to want just the paperback rights? Um, and so I'm curious if there's enough worth, I guess, you know, for an indie, a midlist indie author um, to worry about splitting those rights up and, you know, just leaving the paperbacks fallow. Um, 
And if I got it translated myself, like should I just focus on ebook? Should I try a print version too? Like what about distribution? Like is it really worth all that trouble? So I'm just kind of curious on your opinion of ebook versus paperback and, and the worth. I would say, and it always it depends on the genres you're working is that on. Urban fantasy specifically. Okay, then I would say, then I can tell you. I would say it's 45% um, Kindle Unlimited, 45% sales, and around 10% um, paperback. Okay. And for example, we specifically we aren't using the large okay, um, print on demand provider. We're using the local one that is um, essentially the sister company. Of, a, of the German largest wholesaler. But yes. your company does ebook and paperback? Yeah. This is LM, LM, LMPN. LMPN. Okay. Yeah. And because they have the advantage, our books are orderable in every bookstore in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. They may not place it on the shelf, but we can tell the people, because in Germany we have a lot of people that say, ah, oh, I don't want to book, uh, to buy from the large uh, marketplace. And uh, then we said, no problem. Go to your um, personal book dealer and ask them to order them. Normally, within one or two days, they have the book. I would just add, um, you can proceed with caution, but make sure that whatever translation is done, that you still have the right to use that translation should you want to do a paperback, should you want to do an audio book, because you wouldn't want that ebook person to have owned the rights to that specific translation and then have to like buy them back in order to get an audiobook made with the same text. Well, so if they're paying their own money, I mean, is it normal for me to ask for rights to a translation that I didn't help pay for? Or is it normal for me to offer some sort of, well, here, I'll help pay for it so that I have rights to that translation so that I can go do it in paperback if you do it in ebook? Like, what, how does that normally work? So have you paid for it, or do you have a profit share model? Well, I mean, I'm assuming if I get an if I get an offer for an ebook, yeah, for, for example, if, if you if you make a deal profit share deal with a translator, and I would say for the translator, um, when when you're later than producing audiobooks, they get the cut um, for the translation. And so I, it's the I same guess, for the I books. guess I mean like working with a publisher. Normally the publisher would own the translation. Yeah. I think that that's going to depend on who the publisher is. So they're going to have just whatever their standard agreement is, and that's going to be the typical way that they operate. Whether they're work, whether or not they're willing to work outside of that is really going to be a conversation. So when you get the agreement, see, my guess is that they would be the owner of that translation. That would be what I would consider probably the standard way that would work. That doesn't mean that you could say you couldn't say, hey, you know, is there a way that we could work out where I could have rights to use this for paperback and audio, and that they wouldn't be open to that. But just you'll just have to have that conversation with that company. Um, me again. I have a series of business books that are going to have limited interest outside of the U.S. just because of the topic. But I'm also curious, what's your assessment of Spanish language sales in the United States? Is that something that's worth capitalizing on? Um, you would think it might be more substantial than it is. And no, I'm not really an expert in this topic, but um, it's still not... Um, that big of a, it's not that sizable. Um, I mean, I, I can just tell a re reflection off of what the uh, the culture out of Spain is doing. Yeah, so their work plan is essentially Spain first, you know, Europe first, um, and then the South American, you know, Mexico, Latin American market. Um, but it's definitely, you know, like the, the U.S. Spanish market specifically, let's say, is it, it, it's not even brought up. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at their priorities. Should are probably reflecting the reality of the market. Thank you. Again, you could probably dig around Amazon, like popular business books in the U.S. market. See if they have Spanish editions in the states, and see how many ratings and reviews they have. Uh, and, and actually, one idea. Um, uh, and this is using actually, if I don't know if you use AMS, but um, you know it's the marketing mechanism that Amazon uses. But there's a, there's a cheap way to actually get some of that information with some level of certainty. Um, you know, you can actually create, you know, you can mock up 
a campaign, a category campaign, and say, hey, I want to add a category, and you list the categories, let's say, for your business. And it'll show you all the business categories. And one of those business categories, I, oftentimes I see it, and I don't usually use it because I have no interest in it, but you know, they'll say, you know, let's say business book, you know, in Japanese, business book in Spanish, and you'll see, you know, 23, or yeah. So it gives you an idea of what the population of those books are on the Amazon database. So that'll also reflect on the problem. There was some talk uh, a little a few minutes ago about uh, finding translators and vetting translators, and I heard about Reedsy and, and also the good suggestion about looking in the books. But I wanted to mention the, the ATA website for anybody who might be looking for translators. It's a really good search engine. You know, you can filter it. The ATA is the American Translators Association. Right? It's the biggest, the only really major uh, translation association in the United States. And its search engine searches through its members, and, and they have an automatic vetting program, which is the certification program, right? So, you know, among the filter boxes that you can check, such as years of experience, you know, native language, um, and it's not just all, um, you know, Americans, for lack of a better word. There's a lot of foreign people in the America, you know. So if you're looking for a native speaker translator, which you always should, that's in there also, it's not just American people. But um, but yeah, so they have the vetting with the certification, and it's just a really good resource for finding translators. Thank you. If you are, if you are doing this um, on your own, what kind of a budget, what kind of, kind of expenses um, might you be looking at, roughly, ballparks? I think that really depends on your process. So I think that, um, you know, for us, you, you gotta pay attention, right? You're gonna be, not only are you gonna be potentially paying a translator, which that cost really, really varies, and I think that uh, MA or Applicant will have better numbers on that, or for maybe Jen uh, and so here. Um, for us, it's copy editing, a proofread. Uh, you gotta get your cover art redone. You're gonna have to do your formatting process again. If you're going paperback, then you're, you're going to have your formatting and your cover art for your paperback as well. Um, and then if you're paying someone to, to do advertising, you know, uh, translations on your ads or images for your ads, you're going to have all of those expenses as well. So pretty much any expense that you have for producing a book, you're going to have that same expense uh, going into any marketplace that you go into. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you the numbers that are going to be on the high end. Um, yeah, because they're, they're, and there are different approaches, so there, there are cheaper ways, and I think they can actually talk to some of the profit sharing stuff, the options, and stuff like that. But, you know, so, so the approach I take, I choose to take, um, is you know, I, I have a direct relationship uh, with, with, with the translator, uh, I have a proofing system, you know, each one of those people have to get paid, you know, and, and these are all tribe, you know, they, they, they also work in tribe hub, so, you know, they're not in expensive. So it really depends on word count, obviously, on the book. Um, but let's just, yeah, and I'll give you all of our numbers. You know, um, you know, for me, my translation costs tend to be, let's say for an 80,000-word book, about $5,000 for the translator. Um, you, know, you know, maybe about $500 for the proof um, You know, the, for me to convert an existing book cover that's in English to, you know, and, and usually the translator will, you know, do all the, you know, text adjustments and stuff like that. And give me a translation for all the book cover. And, and also the, the retail store, you, you need it for the retail store. So there's a whole lot of little translations that have to happen. Um, and, you know, so, but, but my book cover conversion is like eight bucks, a hundred bucks, something like that. Um, and that's about it. I mean, that, that's the extent. But you know, you're probably $6,000 all in on an 80,000 book, or an 80,000 book. I just wanted to add one thing to that note about word count. I think that is such a good thing for you guys to be thinking about when deciding to enter into this because it does have huge implications for the expense um, and, and not just for indies but for publishers. Um, the Podium team just came back from the Frankfurt Book Fair which is the largest international fair for um, selling rights in the publishing industry and that repeatedly hearing how publishers are looking for content that is on the shorter side because 
everything has become so much more expensive. Um, and of course, this is published, <laughs> traditional publishing ma mainly that we were speaking with. And it, it, I just want to bring it up because it's always a little bit different from the indie model, but that's you know the expectation, international publishing. Um, so they're looking for things like dark romance and romantic and not necessarily a, a 300,000 word uh, lit RPG masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Super quick question. So um, I have a handful of readers that message me repeatedly, and they're like, I read in English, but all my friends read in German. It's always Germany. That's always the market. So I'm very curious, like, what is the percentage of readers in Germany that read in English versus German, if you know those numbers? I would say not more than 10% are reading in English. A lot, uh, of course, we um, all have English in school. But for me, for example, I started reading in English because the German publishers, the traditional publishers, weren't able to churn out the books fast enough. So I started over reading English books and then sometimes came into the indie part of the publishing. Right, a um, lot of my readers are like, I learned to read English because so, I wanted to read English books, basically. Um, so a lot of um, German readers like to read in German. It's the same um, with movies and series because when I explain American people, hey, um, our our movies and, and series are all um, dubbed, so with, with, with German audio, they most likely don't understand it, what I what I really mean, and and that's the reason. For example, um, Dutch people they usually have um, the English versions with Dutch subtitle, so it's really hard to get um, translations in Dutch to the people because they all used to. English and they read mostly in English. Yeah, it's kind of like thinking about how many people are watching foreign language TV on Netflix, and if they are, are they listening to the dub or the original language? Because it's not as many people as you might think, but they're definitely, I, I think that what you said is true, there's always going to be that like small percentage of nerds that want to get in early and are willing to go the extra mile, and I think there is definitely a desire for a lot of the kinds of content you guys might be writing. Like we 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 went to the Keeper Fairlock um, stand, and one of their key titles for the fall is Ruby Dixon's Ice Planet Barbarians. So like the the doors are opening. <laughs> we are bringing alien romance to the world. <laughs> and you know I, she does she is she's working with the track publishers now too, but started out as an indie. And to add, we German people, we are not like the French, but we look um, very strange at you when you are speaking English to us. So it's the chances are that we understand you, but we usually prefer to read in German. So that answered my question. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, we're all out of time. Thank you all for sticking through that.